And the last recording for the semester is about crystal field theory. So I was just talking about how we can have paramagnetism and diamagnetism, even if it has the same number of electrons in the d orbital. So how is that? Well, we are going to talk about crystal field theory, which is really just the splitting of d orbitals. So a d orbital usually has five or well, a D subshell usually has five orbitals in it. Um, and we assume that they're all at the same energy level. Well, sometimes that's not the case. So when a ligands electron pairs form a bond or interact with or share with the D orbital electrons in a transition metal, it actually changes their energy levels. So these are the normal D orbitals, right? You get the, don't, the weird donut one, and then the ones with two lobes that are in all the different directions. You don't have to be able to draw those. But those are normal D orbitals. Those are the options. And they actually change their energetics when we start bonding things to them. So when we put ligands on there. So this is what's going to happen. Okay. Usually they're all like right here. Okay. A metal by itself, say we're using silver or whatnot. Um, it's got five uh, orbitals in that D subshell. Now, when you start sticking things onto it, those D orbitals kind of tend to split. And in an octahedral complex, so if it's got six things stuck to that middle transition metal, it is going to have the D orbitals are going to split into two that are higher than the other three. And if we followed our rules, our off bar rules, we would fill these three before we would fill these two. So the splitting of D orbitals is going to affect the properties that we are going to see. Okay. So what causes um, this splitting to be very large or to be very small? Because if they're close together, then they can spread out and then pair up. But if the difference in those D orbitals is really big, you can have to fill the bottom ones before you go to the top ones. And what causes that difference is the different types of lig ligands. Okay. Different ligands cause more or less splitting. Uh, chlorine, for example, does not cause that much splitting of the D orbital, so they can kind of spread out. But if you have like cyanide on there, you have Actually get a very large splitting and so the uh, electrons have to stay in that bottom three and then fill up the two. Now you don't have to know why they go in this order but these are this is kind of a reference you can use to figure out which ones are going to cause a lot of splitting or just a little splitting. So the difference okay is we call them there's some vocabulary terms here you'll need to know weak field or strong field. So the weak field ones are over here. They don't cause much splitting. This one here is a weak field. Okay, so they did split, but they're close together. So if I have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons, I'm still going to spread them out in all five before I start pairing them up. So that's called a weak field because they're still close together. It is also called high spin. And it's called high spin because I have as many unpaired electrons as possible. So more, more of like the plus one half spins you can think of. So cobalt with six fluorines on it looks like this because fluorine is a weak field ligand. It doesn't split much. Okay? So spread out the electrons in all five orbitals before pairing up because they are close in energy. So I have more unpaired electrons. The opposite is with strong fields. These have large splitting or large differences, right? That's what that triangle means. So this was our example is cobalt with cyanides on it. So notice cyanide is a very strong field splitter. So if you have cyanide attached there, what's going to happen is the D orbitals are going to split the same way they did over here. I get two and three, but this is a very large energy difference. So the electrons actually have to fill the bottom parts before they fill those top two. Okay, you can't spread them completely out in the five. So strong field or low spin, because we have as many pair now as possible, um, are kind of synonymous. So they spread out um, and then pair up, but in the bottom level first and then the top level. So we get more paired electrons. So these two, this one has unpaired electrons and this one doesn't, and that is how we get the different magnetisms. So it's really because of those ligands bonding to our transition metals and causing either a weak or strong splitting. So this we were just talking about these are octahedral complexes. So octahedron split like this. And if you look at your equation sheet, it's on there. I'm going to show you really quick. So this is what your equation sheet looks like. Um, this is octahedral field that I was just talking about. You'll notice it's got two up top and three in the bottom. 
And then tetrahedral and square planar actually split differently. So we're going to talk about that. Tetrahedral looks like this. It's three on top and two on bottom. And square planar looks like this. One, 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 and then two. So I'm going to talk about how this happens versus this happens and what's going to happen with their splitting. Okay, so tetrahedral complexes, uh, you'll notice when we were on the equation sheet that they were really close together, um, and they go three on top and two on bottom. So tetrahedral is always a small delta or a small change or a small splitting or a weak field. You can think of it all of those ways. It's always high spin, so they're going to spread out completely before they start pairing up. Whereas square planar complexes that split like this, you get one, 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 two. You don't have to know the names like the denotations of D. But that delta or the energy difference or their strong field are always going to be large. Okay, So it's always low spin. That means you start at the bottom, fill this one first, and then this one, and then this one, and then this one. Okay, so what I want you to do for example 10 is draw the crystal field energy level diagrams with the appropriate number of D electrons for each listed complex. Now I do want to go back to the equation sheet really quick. Okay, so looking here, you guys are going to have this, all right? So tetrahedral, tetrahedral, sorry, if I tell you it's tetrahedral, it's going to look like this, three on top, two on bottom, and it's always a small splitting, so they're always close together. Octahedral is always going to look like this, two on top, three on bottom, but it can be high spin or low spin. It can be strong field or weak field, depending on what it's attached to. And then square planar always splits one, 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 two, and it is always strong field. So you always fill these two, then this one, then this one, then this one. So I would use this to try to complete that example. Okay, let's go through it. So I have cobalt with six chloride. So I know that's octahedral. So I should draw my diagram like this, two with three from the equation sheet, and that it is high spin. High spin means I'm going to have as many unpaired as possible. So I'm going to spread them out in all five before I start pairing them up. Now, you might have been like, well, how did I figure out how many electrons to put in this d orbital? Well, you have to first figure out the charge on your metal. Okay. So I have six chlorines here, and chlorines are minus one, so that's minus six. So cobalt had to be plus three. So that means I had to figure out cobalt plus three, how many d electrons it has. Well, regular cobalt is 4s2, 3d7. So remember, you always take the s ones out first, and then I took one out of the d, so I had six left. So it was a 3d6, and that's how I knew it would be six electrons. Okay, now I've got vanadium with six ammonias here. So it is an octahedral. So again, I drew the two and the bottom three. Um, vanadium, in this case, uh, ammonia doesn't have any charge. So it's vanadium two plus. So vanadium is normally 4s2, 3d3. So those two just came out of the 4s, so it's still 3d3. And no matter if this is high spin or low spin, I just have three on the bottom. Um, because I don't have anywhere else to put them or pair them up or anything. So these two up here don't really matter. Okay. Um, in nickel chloride, I told you it is tetrahedral. So I know that my diagram is going to look like this. Three on top, two on bottom. Tetrahedral is always high spin, always a small delta. So I'm going to keep them all together and spread out completely before I pair up. So chloride has a charge of negative one. So I have four of them, so that's negative four. So to be negative two overall, then the nickel had to have been plus two. Nickel is regularly 4s2, 3d8. So now I'm just left with 3d8 because I lost those two electrons from the s orbital. So if it's got eight, I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Spread out completely before pairing them up because tetrahedral is always close together or high spin. All right, D, I have platinum chloride. Uh, I figured out the charge on platinum is plus two, so it's 5D8. I told you it was square planar, so I copied this down from my equation sheet. It goes one, 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 and two. So if I have eight, remember this is large splitting. So I fill these two, and then I fill this one, and then I fill this one, okay? So this would not have any in it. And finally, iron uh, with six cyanides. So this is octahedral. Um, I told you it's low spin. So that means it has a high splitting. So that means I stay in the bottom before I go up top. 
cyanide, um, this would be negative six. So iron has to be plus two. So it's 3D6. And so since it's large splitting, because I said it's low spin, they all go on the bottom. One, two, three, and then four, five, six. So spread out just on the bottom before we go to the top level. All right, so those might take some practice and there are some on the group assignment. Now, finally, we can measure that delta. And this is where the colors are going to come in because the excited electrons are jumping between those d orbitals. So um, the splitting or the energy associated with those splitting is calculated by hc over lambda. You've seen this before from Chem 161. H is a constant that I would give you. That's Planck's constant. C is the speed of light right there. So we can calculate what wavelength is going to be spit out or used in that splitting. So if a compound is, remember, we're sticking with that one that most of them are. If a compound is red, it's going to observe green. It is the um, complementary colors, okay? And those colors are associated with this wavelength that we can calculate here. Okay, now I do want you to notice C is in meters per second. So whenever you plug in a wavelength, it does have to be in meters so that all your units work out. So example number 11 says the iron thiocyanate complex that we use in the equilibrium constant lab was a deep red color. The wavelength setting used on the spectrophotometer was 550 nanometers. Explain why this makes sense. Well, 550 is green if you check your equation sheet. So that's why it's red. We wanted it to absorb green. It was best at 550. Okay, so then determine the crystal field for the Fe3 plus um, I said it actually has five water molecules also attached in addition to the thiocyanate. So this is octahedral. If it's got five waters and a thiocyanate, that's why I told you that. So I know it's octahedral. So I know my split is going to look like this, two and three. Okay. I don't know if it's high or low spin yet or not. Um, and the approximate value for delta. So that is the energy. I'm looking for this. I want to know approximately what is that based on this wavelength? So this is just a plug and chug. Um, like I said, you do have to convert your wavelength to meters first before you plug it in. Then H times C over my wavelength gives me 3.61 times 10 to the 19th joules. So that is the energy splitting or the, the difference in energy between the high and the low levels of my D split. Now it is iron three plus, so I know that it's 3D5 because iron is regularly 4S2, 3D6. Um, so I only have five electrons. So I didn't tell you if it was high spin or low spin because octahedral can go either way. If this energy amount is low spin, so if this is small, um, then that means that they are going to, whoops, sorry, I said that wrong. If this energy amount is high, Okay, if, they, if there is strong splitting, it is a strong field, then these will be split quite a bit. Um, so it would be filling up the bottom before I go to the top. Um, if it was a high spin or if this is a small amount of energy, then they would be close together. So I would spread out before I pair up. So this would be called high spin and this one would be low spin. Um, I should draw these a, these a little bit further and these a little bit closer just for consistency's sake. Here we go. Low spin is further apart and high spin is closer together. 